here, Joanne, you can take this. OK, so today it's great pleasure that we have Joanne um, thesis defense. Actually, Joanne, uh, for those of you that remember, was actually admitted in the first class of the bioinformatics program ever. She was uh, one of the four students that were said they were going to come. Uh, but then she told us that she's not coming. She's coming in a year. <laughs> and so a year later, she came. Uh, and so we were very happy to have her. I remember during the admissions process, there was like Joanne, kind of, and then everyone else. <laughs> there was, um, and she did really well. And obviously, she's had a, a great PhD. She's been in my lab um, since after she finished her rotations. Um, she's d contributed a huge amount of work. She's done. Uh, she'll, some of the work that she talks about is um, particularly the one of the papers that she talks about on NICE is one of, when I give when I'm invited to give a talk it's one of the main things that I talk about. Um, she's contributed in many ways, many collaborations uh, with Jake's group, and she's uh, overall also a fantastic person as well as a great scientist and very lucky that she's actually going to stay in the lab for a couple years as a postdoc afterwards as well. Okay, thanks Eliezer for the introduction and thanks for everybody coming to my defense. Uh, today I'll talk about some of the research projects that I have been working on during my PhD. And the title of my talk is Design of Efficient and Accurate Statistical Approaches to Correct for Confounding Effects in Genetic Association Studies. So first I'll start with some high level introduction of the genetic association studies and the confoundings. So 99.9% .9 of human genome sequences are identical, however the small amount of differences in the remaining genome accounts for the variability in human population. And these differences are called the genetic variants. The most common type of the genetic variants is the SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a single letter change in DNA sequence. So people have been searching for these genetic variants that potentially cause the phenotypic changes. So this is a toy example that shows the genetic association studies. So you have the a sequence of individuals and you have their cholesterol level. And let's say you have two variants, SNP1 and SNP2. It appears that SNP2 is more strongly associated with the cholesterol level than the SNP1, and we call this SNP2 as a causal SNP for the cholesterol level. So to find this causal SNP, you need a statistical way to evaluate the significance of the associations so we have two hypotheses, the null hypothesis that assumes the SNP does not affect the phenotype, and the alternative hypothesis that assumes the SNP affects the phenotype. So these are the two alleles of the SNP and the phenotype values, and each star represents an individual. So given the data set, uh, we, you want to test which model fits better the data, whether this null model that, uh, with no slope or this alternative model that allows for the differences in the phenotype means. So in GWAS, we use this simple uh, linear model to test the association between each uh, variant and the phenotype. So this Y represents the phenotype values of N individuals, mu is the model mean, X is the genotype values of K SNP, A beta is their effect size, and E is the environmental effect from, from the multivariate normal distribution with some variance sigma E square I. Actually, here I stands for the identity matrix. So in this simple linear model, we assume the individuals in the samples are in IID. Under this linear model, uh, you can estimate the uh, effect size beta hat to get the test statistics. And using a significance threshold, uh, you determine whether this association is significant or not. With the advance of high throughput technologies, it's possible to perform this uh, genetic association studies on a genome-wide scale. We call it genome-wide association studies. So in this GWAS, we collect many, many SNPs over the whole genome, and then we uh, look for the correlation between each SNP and the phenotype by performing these association studies. And we show the result in this uh, plot called the Manhattan plot. So the axis show the SNP locations uh, color-coded by chromosome, and the y-axis shows the strength of the association. And we use a predetermined uh, significance threshold to find the variants that are associated with the phenotype of interest as a level of significance. 
Uh, although GWAS has successfully identified many variants associated with various traits, it has been reported in many studies that there are various confounding factors that exist in the um, genetic data that complicates this association analysis. And I'll explain the later slide, but this creates a correlation between the individuals in the sample called the intersample correlation. And this caused the spurious association leading to uh, many false identifications. These confounding factors not only uh, cause the spurious associations, but it also um, alters the significance threshold in the multiple hypothesis testing. So the allele frequencies are different from population to population due to its own um, unique uh, genetic or social history, and this is called a population structure, which is one of the representative and widespread confounding factors in GWAS datasets. And this creates a correlation between the individuals, which is not modeled in our simple uh, testing linear model, which assumes the IID between the individuals. And it turned out this caused an inflation in the association statistic, uh, leading to many false positives. So this, uh, this graph is from the Nature Review 2012 that shows how serious problem this population structure can cause in the GWAS. So these are the Manhattan plots before and after they uh, take into account this population structure in their association statistics. So the true genetic model of this data set, they contain some form of confounding effects. They create the correlation between the individuals. And this is not modeled in this our uh, testing linear model. So in the linear mix model, they have an extra term U that uh, incorporates this intersample correlation structure. So it kind of absorbs this confounding effect. So you can test the association between the SNP and the phenotype independent of this uh, confounding effect. Uh, when we are considering the population structure, we often use the term heritability, which measures how much the, the variation in the phenotypes are due to a genetic variation. So it kind of gives you the idea how much the phenotypes are affected by the population structure. So these are the topics that I have been working on during my PhD, and I show it in, in three categories. And um, today I'll uh, only show one representative uh, uh, work from each of the categories. So from the first category of EQTL studies and genomic phenotypes, I'll introduce NICE, which try to identify the true regulatory hotspots in EQTL studies. And in the second category of the GWAS method, I'll introduce multi-trends, which is a multiple testing correction in linear mix model. And lastly, I will introduce gamma, which is a high dimensional multiple phenotype analysis. So let's start with the NICE, which um, corrects for the unknown confounding factors and identify true regulatory hotspots. So GWAS, uh, GWAS has identified many associations uh, uh, related to complex traits. However, their biological mechanism underlying these associations are not well understood. So people are interested in these EQTLs, which are genetic variants that regulate the gene expressions to under, kind of get this biological inside of this association. So instead of using the phenotypes in EQTL studies, they use the gene expression as an intermediate phenotype, and they look for the association between the SNP and the um, gene expressions. So there are tons of EQTL papers published every month. And in this EQTL studies, we look on this map called the EQTL map, which is basically a map that you uh, stack over all the Manhattan plots of all the genes. So you can easily look for the EQTLs on a genomized scale. So this axis shows the SNP locations, and Y axis shows the gene locations, and the uh, each color of each pixel represents the strength of the association between each SNP and the gene. So, for example, the um, EQTLs on this diagonal band shows the cis EQTLs that reside near the target gene. The very interesting observation in this EQTL map is we see a lot of these vertical lines, which suggest that the thousands of genes are transregulated by a small number of genetic variants called the transregulatory hotspots. And this is a very important evidence of the uh, master regulator of the transcription. So for example, you have a master regulator that turns on and off many, many genes, and you have a SNP associated with the master regulator. 
then these genes will be indirectly associated with the SNF through this method regulator. And the studies of this has supported, uh, provided much evidence supporting the existence of this master regulator that induced these transregulatory hotspots. Uh, several EQTL studies have successfully identified this uh, regulatory hotspot. However, the studies in RI mice, they reported their uh, regulatory hotspots replicate poorly. So this is the graph I got from the 2008 genetics paper. They showed their regulatory hotspots between two replicates are so different. So they show a slightly negative correlation. And in the previous studies, uh, they discovered that these are from the spurious associations induced by various confounding factors, such as a batch effect or other technical artifacts that induce the noise during the sample preparation or expression measurements, et cetera. And here's a tool example show how this confounding effect can cause these spurious hotspots. So uh, let's say the gene expression of the first half of the samples were measured on day one, and the rest of the samples were measured on day two. And let's say there is a technical artifact, so uh, all the measurement on day one is higher than those of day two. Then this will create the correlation between the individuals. So this uh, first five samples uh, looks to be correlated to each other, and the rest of the uh, samples look to be correlated to each other just because of the, this technical artifacts. And as uh, GWAS tests tens of millions SNP, by SNP, uh, some SNP by chance can segregate the sample in a manner consistent with this intersample correlation structure. So for example, you have a SNP that has A for the first half of the sample and T for the rest of the sample, then this SNP will uh, spiritually associate with many of the genes because of the, this technical artifacts, even if it does not have any true effects. And this is the uh, graphical model that explains this situation. So for example, you have a SNP1. It has a, a true genetic effects on some of the genes, thus is a regulatory hotspot. Unlike SNP1, SNP2 is spiritually associated with many of the genes through this confounding factor. And this creates uh, many spurious hotspots in the EQTL map. So there are many computational approaches that try to solve this problem using some statistical approaches like SVB or a linear mix model. However, they either fail to remove these confounding effects or they uh, both remove the true effects and the confounding effects in our experiments. So the main uh, assumption of most of this previous method is that um, these confounders are prone to have the broad effects, so influencing the global correlation uh, structure of the gene expressions. So one of the uh, previous method eyes, under this assumption, they model this global correlation structure using all of the genes and incorporate this global stru uh, structure in the um, new term of the linear mix model to account for it. This will capture the, uh, this will remove the confounding effects. However, any regulatory hotspots in the case of the three genes will also be captured in this global correlation structure and will be eliminated. So that's why when we apply eyes, you kind of remove all the signals in the data. So you use all the information, you uh, lose all the signals. So our approach nice to try to eliminate the spurious hotspot while uh, retaining the uh, true hotspots. So we have the same assumptions like I said, with confounding factors affect most of the genes, thus any subset of the genes are likely to capture this global correlation structure, while the genetic uh, effects only affect the subset of the genes. And another assumption we have is the true genetic effects are likely to be much stronger than the confounding effects. So under these assumptions, uh, we, unlike ICE, we uh, model this global correlation structure using only a subset of the genes with weaker effects. So for example, you use only these bottom four genes with weaker effects. This will capture this global correlation structure, but this will not capture this genetic effects, so that's why we can retain the true regulatory hotspots. So we simulated the data. We implanted our five stress regulatory hotspots, shown in the blue arrows, and we implanted one big batch effect. We caused a lot of spirit suspects shown in the red errors. So what we expect is when we apply our method, we only see these blue errors without the red ones. 
So we applied a different method on this simulated data, and as a result, NICE was able to capture these five transregulatory hotspots without any spurious ones. However, um, the previous method, either they failed to remove the confounding ones or they kind of remove all the signals in the data. And actually, in this uh, simulated study, the SVA worked pretty well just because um, SVA captures the confounding effect based on the PCA. And in our simulated data, there is only one big, big batch effect, which will for sure be captured by the PCA. But in the later slide, that I'll show you that SVA does not work in the real data set, which has more complicated confounding. So we have two East data sets, um, generated three years apart at different locations. So any regulatory hotspot that are shared between two data sets are likely to be the real ones. However, the ones that ex present in only one of the data sets are likely to be the spurious one. So first we uh, computed the um, p-value using the standard t-test, and we merged two data sets by taking the maximum p-value between the two. And we uh, defined the hotspot level, which is the average minus log p values over the genes to uh, measure where the hotspots are. So from this merge data set, uh, we identified tw uh, uh, 12 putative regulatory hotspots in terms of this uh, hotspot level. So we applied each, each method to the 2005 East data set. And we evaluate the uh, performance by um, using this uh, 12 putative hotspots. And this axis just shows the SNP locations and Y axis shows the hotspot levels. So as a result, uh, I, NICE was able to identify 10 out of 12 putative hotspots and only one uh, spurious hotspot outperformed the previous method. And you can see this SVA does not work well in the real data set. So there are more experiments and the results in the paper, and this paper was published in uh, 2014 Genome Biology. The next project that I want to introduce is a multi-trans, which is a multiple testing correction in linear mixed model. So in GWAS, uh, we set a significant threshold to find the variance so associated with the phenotype of interest at some level of significance. So for example, if you set the significant threshold of 5%, you uh, expect, you observe the um, prob uh, probability of um, getting the false positive 0 0.05. Uh, however, when you're testing 100 variants and you set the significant threshold of 5% for each of the variants, then the probability of observing at, le uh, at least one significant signal only due to chance is more than 99%. So you want to uh, find this per marker threshold that can control this overall significant level of 5%. Five, 5 this is the multiple testing. And the challenge of this uh, multiple testing in GWAS data set is many of the markers are correlated to each other. So typical, uh, typical multiple testing approach like a Bonferroni correction is not applicable because they don't consider the LD structure in the data. So the permutation test has been widely believed as the gold standard in the um, uh, GWAS data set because it can accurately account for this LD structure. The problem is it's computationally very expensive. So there are some MVN, the multivariate normal distribution uh, based approaches uh, that try to uh, speed up this sampling process of the permutation test. So they directly sample the statistic from the MVN. And besides, there are a lot of other multiple testing approaches for the uh, GWAS data set. However, uh, none of them are aware of the fact that this per marker threshold differs as a function of the genetic relatedness. So none of the methods are applicable when there is a population structure exists in the uh, uh, GWAS data set. So for example, in the permutation test, let's say you permute the phenotypes. So in from this permuted phenotype, you can estimate the test statistics under the null hypothesis of no association. And from these null samples, you can estimate the permarker thresholds. So uh, assuming this model, this permuting process is equivalent to, like example, the phenotype from the E. This is because when you permute, you break the association between the phenotype and the genotype. However, when there is a population structure, to get the true null samples, you have to get samples from U and E, not only U. 
And the problem is when you permute the phenotypes, this not only breaks the association between the phenotype and genotypes, but it also breaks the structure of the U. So the null samples you got from the uh, permutation test is not the true null samples in this case. You can get the true null samples by uh, uh, applying this parametric bootstrapping to the multiple testing. Uh, so given the data, you can fit it into linear mix model to estimate the model parameters. And then using this model parameters, you can get the null samples from there. You can use it as a gold standard uh, uh, for the, under the linear mix model. However, the problem is this is computationally very, very expensive. Also, you can um, speed up this sampling process of uh, parametric bootstrapping using the MVN-based approaches. So utilizing the fact that statistic over multiple markers asymptotically follow the normal distribution, multivariate normal distribution, uh, you can get this statistic uh, from the MVN. So this is a PDF of the bivariate MVN at two markers. And uh, outside of this uh, shaded rectangle region shows the critical region where you reject the null hypothesis. The strength of this approach is the covariance of the statistics are equal to the correlation of the genotypes, which means you can get this MVN directly from the genotypes without um, generating any null phenotypes or uh, estimate the statistic from there. This is possible because you want the statistic under the null. So this is very fast. <laughs> Test your <laughs> <first> level. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> the problem is when there is a population structure, uh, this equality no longer holds. This is because the typical MVN-based approach is they assume the IID between the individuals. However, um, when there's a population structure, it creates a correlation between the individuals which, uh, which violates this IID assumption. So this, the covariance of the statistics are no, no longer equal to the correlation of the genotypes. So our approach, the multi-trends, the high-level idea is we decorrelate this uh, correlation structure by rotating the uh, genotypes and phenotype space with their variances. So in this rotated space, the individuals are in IID, so you can estimate the covariance of stat statistic from these uh, transformed genotypes. So this shows the differences between the covariance of the statistics and the correlation of the genotypes um, before and after you perform this transformation of the genotypes. So the, we generated uh, four different data sets uh, with different heritabilities from the HMDP. And this axis shows the differences and the y-axis shows the frequencies. So as you can see, as the heritability increases, this difference increases when you don't do this transformation of the genotypes. However, when you use the transformed genotypes, these differences are very small, it's very close to zero. So we uh, evaluate the accuracy of our, our approach multi-trends by, uh, by comparing the per marker threshold uh, for different, for different heritability cases. So we compare with the Bonferroni and the slide, which is uh, uh, MVN-based approach, and the parametric bootstrapping, which provides the gold standard under the linear mix model. So as a result, multi-trans uh, provides as accurate per marker threshold as the parametric bootstrapping for different heritability case. However, uh, diff uh, uh, other methods were not able to. We also compare the efficiency of the uh, multi-trans with, uh, multi with the bootstrapping, which provides the, uh, which works accurately under a linear mix model. And uh, this axis shows the number of individuals and Y axis shows the running times in minutes and days. So for the 5,000 individual case, 
The bootstrapping takes more than four years, but our methods were able to do this in three to four hours, depends on the LD structure of the data. So there are a lot more experiments as results in the paper, and this article is under review. And actually, we got a pretty um, good review from genome biology last week, so yeah, we expect that we can publish the paper soon. And then lastly, uh, I'll introduce gamma, the high-dimensional multiple phenotype analysis for a structured population. The typical GWAS, we examine the correlation between each phenotype and genotype pair one at a time, called a single phenotype analysis. However, often it is very useful to analyze multiple phenotypes together, especially with the high uh, throughput technologies, it's uh, preferable to do uh, mm. high dimension of multiple phenotype analysis. So for example, you want to detect the variance associated with the profile of gut microbiota with tens of thousands of species, or you want to detect the regulatory hotspots which, uh, in EQTL studies, which contains thousands of genes. So there are many multivariate regression analysis you can apply to the multiple phenotype analysis. However, they are designed for the use with a small number of uh, variables, so they are not applicable for the high dimensional data. So most, uh, the vast majority of the, uh, uh, this high dimensional multiple phenotype analysis, they use some form of data reduction techniques such as a cluster analysis. However, they have some issues like how many clusters to use, and actually they're they only focusing on the initial reduction of the dimension of the data, so they don't really provide a biological meaning for the clusters. In 2012, Dapala alternatively proposed a method called the MDMR. They use, uh, use this dissimilarity matrix um, to uh, consider how a predictor variable is related to the similarity between the individuals with respect to the gene expression as a whole. So this provides, uh, uh, it, this, this does not require any problematic data reduction step. So they provide the exact solution, not the heuristic. Unfortunately, none of the, this previous methods were able to account for the population structure. In our experiment, we show that um, this creates a serious problem in the multiple phenotype analysis. This is because this bias due to the population structure accumulates for each phenotype. So as the number of phenotype increases, this bias grows. So when this is the Manhattan plot when I uh, applied the MDMR to, uh, to the microbiome data, and as you can see, like most of the variance looks to be correlated to the phenotype. Actually, there are some recent linear mixed model based uh, multiple phenotype approaches. Uh, they try to consider this population structure. However, their computational time increases quadratically with the number of phenotypes, so they are not applicable for the high dimensional data. So our method, gamma, uh, try to analyze this high dimensional multiple phenotypes considering the population structure. So we adapt the idea of the MDMR for the multivariate regression, and we integrate the linear mixed model in their test statistics um, to consider this population structure. So the high level idea is the same that we use for the multi-trends. So in this rotated space, the individuals are in IID. So we can update the MDMR statistic in this rotated space. So we generate a simulated data, got uh, 100 genotypes from the HMDP, which contains a significant amount of the population structure. And we implanted five trans regulatory hotspots where 20% uh, of the genes has very small effect size. So intuitively, uh, uh, we can find them only when we use all, all of the genes together. And we compare with the previous method, the standard t-test and EMMA that implements the linear mixed model to consider the population structure. And actually, these two are single phenotype methods. So we use the average of minus log p-value for the evaluation, and we compare with the MDMR. So uh, these five blue arrows show the transregulatory hotspots we implanted in the data. This axis shows the SNP, and this Y axis shows the average of minus log p-value for this single phenotype analysis case, and minus log p-value for the, um, the multiple phenotype analysis case. So basically, it shows the strength of the association. So as a result, Gamma was able to identify these five transregulatory hotspots without any spurious one. 
And also you can uh, see that this gamma was able to uh, capture these small effects that uh, single phenotype analysis were not able to. And MDMR induced many um, spears hotspots due to the population structure. So this data set is the one that we analyzed for the previous study nice. So this uh, 12 uh, blue star showed the putative hotspot that, that were reported in the previous study. So, uh, and in this data, we uh, apply the genomic control lambda, which is the standard way of uh, um, removing the unknown plausible effects in GWAS data set. And actually, in this EAST data set, we don't contain that much population structure. So even in the t-test, you can see the lambda value is um, not that big. However, in MDMR, we see the huge lambda value, which tells you that even if there is a small bias induced by the population structure, this can create a serious problem in the high dimensional multiple phenotype analysis. And the gamma was able to uh, consider the population structure, so it's very close to one. So we um, scale this uh, statistic using this lambda values. And as a result, gamma was able to identify most of the putative hotspots, while other methods were not able to. We also applied each method to the microbiome data we got from the Genome Research 2015 paper. And a lot of the loci that Gamma identified, we found some uh, strong candidate genes based on the literature and the detail of the results are included in the paper. And in the MR, we see huge inflation. And from the single phenotype analysis, we were not able to find any significant signals. So there are more experiments in the paper, and this was published in the RECOM 2015, and it's under review on JCB. So um, I'll, I want to uh, thank to my committee members first. <laughs> first, Jake. Actually, like, most of the data set I analyze is from his lab, so which means like without his support, I wasn't able to do any of this research. <laughs> and uh, I did my third rotation with him. As anybody knows, like he's very generous, yeah, encouraging, and I learned a lot of things from him. I really thanks to him. And Bogdan and Jason, actually, I wasn't that lucky that I didn't have much chance to work with you guys. <laughs> but um, uh, I took their classes, and uh, most of the, uh, where I, I learned most of the stuff I uh, worked for this, I, I, I used for my uh, um, PhD research. And I wish I could have more chance to work with uh, you um, during my postdoc here in UCLA. And Matteo, actually, um, he was my first advisor. I, I did the rotation, the, my first rotation with him when I first entered this bioinformatics program. And he made me decide to stay in this bioinformatics program. And actually, uh, I got my first paper with him. And as anybody knows, like, it means a lot of things to the PhD students. So. I yeah, really thanks to all my committee members. And Eliezer, um, <laughs> what should I say? <laughs> Actually, I, I, I have a lot of things to say about you, but I don't know what I can say in a few seconds. But yeah, like, first when I joined the lab, um, I asked you know, my seniors, like, how is he, you know? <laughs> and then Hyun, one of our old members, said he's the best advisor in the world. <laughs> and the boom said, like, believe in God, believe in Zar. <laughs> so, like, so, what? <laughs> I was a little bit, you know? But, like, um, I would like to say the same thing to anybody who asked about Zar. They, they didn't really lie to me. <laughs> And um, not, not, uh, to say nothing about his research prospect, um, I, I would say he's a true teacher who really cares about the students. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Sar. And I, I would like to thank to my friends who supported me during the PhD. And I would like to thank all my colleagues. I cannot mention all of them, but um, they're my research colleagues and they're my best of friends. Yeah. And then I want to like to thank my family, uh, my husband, Chang Won Bak, and my, my daughter, Juin Emma Bak, and my second one, I don't have his name yet. <laughs> yeah, but for sure, he, sure his late, the last name will be Bak. Uh -huh. And <laughs> my parents, uh, Sung Gi Ju and Song Hye Kim, for their love and support. Yeah, thank you. Thank, and ev thanks for everybody coming to my defense.
any questions for the committee first? Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in sort of the biological aspects of the regulatory hotspots that survive after you apply um, your correction. Have you looked to us and seen, we're focusing on yeast and yeast results, have you applied the method to human and are there sort of um, um, regulatory hotspots? No, we actually, we only apply to the yeast data set. I, mm -hmm. And I want uh, people in the uh, like at biology labs, they want to use my method to apply to the other data sets too. But in the yeast data set, actually we, um, in the paper we included, but um, in the yeast uh, data set, we have uh, two versions of the 2008 data set. So we uh, compare the, like the hotspots only uh, um, identify the nice to see if they have any like true uh, hotspots and we found found some um, signals there so we reported it in the paper. And then do you have like a biological explanation of what these hotspots report? So they have some uh, candidate like genes that are related to the transcriptions. Yeah, I don't really know detail of the biology but like we reported those uh, genes in the uh, paper. So, well, terrific work, first of all. Uh, just to pick back a little bit on, on, on what, may, may, what Jason might be suggesting, mm -hmm. if you apply this in humans or in, in, in data where there's a strong epigenetic type of control of gene regulation, mm -hmm. you might try to, to characterize those regulatory hotspots to see if there's an enrichment for some epigenetic marks or some chromatin marks. Some yeah, I see. Things that control, that are more accessible mm -hmm. in, in, in more tissues or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I was happy to uh, apply to the human data set. So my, my question was more on the technical side. In terms mm -hmm. of, of NICE, is there a lot of information if you look at the actual threshold of the genes that get into the model to correct for? So uh, um, I, uh, I like just, you just picked a, a no, no, no. Uh, we so um, based on those assumptions I showed, um, actually we uh, use uh, the Bayesian framework, which actually. Um, for our purpose of separating the genes with only confounding effects and only the, uh, with the genetic effects, we use the uh, Bayesian framework, which fits well in our model, because for each gene, it gives a posterior probability that the genetic effects exist or not. So actually, in this uh, EQTL model, it's, it, it turned out this is very equivalent to the uh, meta-analysis model that published in the 2012 PLUS genetics paper that Boom published. So they try to uh, find the studies with the effects and studies without the effects. So we uh, kind of adapted the, the model. Mm. And actually, it turned out it works really well. We did a lot of experiments shown in the paper. And we use a different threshold and the prior information. And they're pretty robust to our methods. So yeah. Question about gamma. So what, what kind of application, what kind of data sets are applicable to that kind of like how many phenotypes do you need? What type of phenotypes are Well, like there is no limitation, but actually for the small number of phenotypes, like the, as I show it, like the MVLMM, like they kind of model this uh, correlation between the phenotypes, so they could be more accurate, but not, they are not applicable for the high dimensional data. So the data that I applied, in, for example, the East data, they contains more than 6,000 genes. So which were like, uh, yeah, so, so, for example, in the, actually, I come up with this project uh, when I was working with this night nice project. They, I want to detect this regulatory mm -hmm. hotspots, but there was not a good way to do this. So, um, yeah, if, for example, you want to detect the regulatory hotspots. Like the EQTL studies, they usually contain more than thousands of genes. So, yeah, you can apply this method in there. Uh, I interpolated from one cr uh, chromosome. I use only one, I, uh, I used only one uh, chromosome, and then I, you know, interpolated from there. You wonder why the cluster was busy. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. So, any questions? Any more questions? Okay. Let's uh, thank Joanne one more time. So, uh, important announcement, uh, Joanne's mother um, made Korean barbecue, <laughs> so we're having in our lab next week at 11.30. So I think the next
next step is that um, everybody leaves except for the committee, and then we talk about uh, we talk about that, and then the committee is back in the. Uh, and Joanne, you have to wait outside. Oh, okay. <laughs>